I don't know how good your memory is for sermons, but about six weeks ago, I had the honor of preaching Psalm 34 here. And uh, Psalm 40 and Psalm 34 are both about trouble. And so I got to watch out. I'm going to have a reputation as, I guess, the troubled pastor. I don't know, or the troubling pastor. But I'm glad to be able to speak about this today because it's ministered to me this week. In the opening of her book called Courage, Dear Heart, the Christian author Rebecca K. Reynolds tells a story about a unique Easter celebration at her church. One year leading up to Easter, uh, they asked everyone in the church to stop by a table on their way out. And on this table were little strips of colorful paper. And they, they were to write one word on these strips of paper. And the prompt for that word was, what is your greatest sorrow or struggle right now. And so everybody was supposed to come and write their greatest sorrow or struggle on one of these pieces of paper. And then, uh, then on Easter, she was going to have them all put, you know, maybe, I don't know, she said decoupage. I don't know what that means. I saw it in writing. She, she affixed them somehow to some plexiglass, and they were going to illuminate them from the back so that on Easter they would be like stained glass windows, right? They would be this image of God making something beautiful out of this brokenness. And I wonder if we assigned that to you, what you would write on that piece of paper, what word you would put down today. Uh, in her church, there were a number of different words, as you can imagine, words like abused, cancer, porn, shame, debt, addict, loneliness, uh, sexual temptation. They cheated with two words. Obesity, my mom, my son, bankruptcy. It was a larger church, and over 200 strips of paper had the single word discouraged. So what would you write? Whether you're 6 or 60, male or female, rich or poor, you have an answer to the question, what is your biggest sorrow, struggle, or trouble right now? We all live in the same broken world, and so everyone can answer that question. It might be something you can reasonably expect will pass. You know, maybe you're sick and you'll get better in a couple weeks or whatever it may be. Or, or it may be something that's going to last longer, maybe your entire life. It could even be something that's terminal. What would you write on that little colorful strip of paper? What's your current trouble? In our text today, Psalm 40, David is in trouble and not for the first time in his life. We don't know the details. We only know that people want to kill him. And it says that in verse 14. And he writes this psalm, and it comes to us in two parts. The first part is all about thanksgiving for God's past deliverance. And then the second part, the last part, is David going to God, seeking him for present deliverance from his current troubles. So according to this psalm, how do we get out of trouble? Well, if we believe in the living God, then strictly speaking, we don't get ourselves out of trouble. Instead, we find peace and hope in the God who can get us out of trouble. The peace and hope and confidence we have in our trouble comes to us by really trusting God to get us out of trouble. And Psalm 40 shows us why and how we can trust God like that in our trouble until he delivers us from our trouble. So that's where we're going this morning, why you can trust God and how or what it looks like to trust God in the midst of your trouble. We're not going to be exhaustive, of course, about why you can trust God. The entire Bible is all about that. But David really gets into one reason you can trust God in this psalm. He leads us to think about one big why, and it's this. You can trust God in your trouble because of God's past goodness. God's past goodness. That's why we can trust in God in our trouble. And in order to do that, you and I will have to know and remember God's past goodness. How can you know whether you can trust a mechanic? How do you know, especially if it's an expensive repair? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can look online to see other people's experience. You know, you can check the Yelp reviews, the Google reviews, whatever they are. Or if you've been there for a while, you can look to your own experience. Have they tried to upsell you needlessly on things in the past? 
Or if you're at a restaurant and you're going to order something you've never ordered there before, how can you know whether you can trust it? Well, again, maybe you saw in the Yelp reviews a certain dish recommended. Or maybe you just have such experience with that restaurant that you know you can trust the chef with whatever comes out. Well, in the scriptures, how can we look to and know and remember God's goodness? We can go to at least three places. Number one, the scripture itself. Number two, the testimony of other believers. And number three, your own experience with the Lord. Some places we can go to know and remember God's goodness. And in this scripture, Psalm 40, we see David's testimony of God's past goodness. And we're reminded to think about our own past experience of God's kindness and faithfulness. And so David starts the psalm, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry for help. In past trouble, David had to wait. As one of my favorite philosophers, Tom Petty, said, the waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard. You take it on faith. You take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. I wonder if you've ever had to wait patiently on the Lord. The Hebrew there for waited patiently is actually, I waited waiting for the Lord. And Hebrew does that a lot, and if it doubles up the word like that, it's for emphasis. In other words, David really waited. It was a lot of waiting. The translators put a nice spin on it with that word patiently, but it sounds like David didn't really have a choice. He's just waiting. It was longer than waiting at the Chick-fil-A line at noon on a Saturday. It was longer than a 40-minute car ride when you're four years old. It was the kind of waiting that's How long, O Lord, waiting? He had to wait. But then what happened? At the end of that waiting, the Lord turned to David and heard his cry for help. The Lord saved him and delivered him. The Lord turned his face to him and heard him. He brought him up out of the pit of despair and set David in a solid place. See, David was remembering back to a specific time when the Lord saved him from trouble. That's what he's doing in the first part of the psalm. We don't know what that specific time was, but David is remembering a specific time of his trouble where the Lord had delivered him. And he remembers how he felt after that and what he did after that. It says in verse 3, he sang God's praises. He put a new song in my mouth, David says, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and they will trust in the Lord. So after this deliverance, David went and wrote a new song about it. He was so freed by what God had done and so joyful about what God had done for him that he went and wrote a song and sang it. And maybe you don't do that in your trouble, after your trouble. Maybe you do. But you can sing after God delivers you. I hope you've experienced that desire to sing to this good God. I know you have because I heard you singing earlier. God's deliverance of David was so thorough that he had to sing about it. I wonder if you can remember a time like that, a specific time in your life. Even if you're in troubled times now, can you think of a specific time when you were so freed by God you wanted to sing? If you're a Christian, you can think of at least one of those times. You can look back and praise the Lord for the day that he opened your eyes to the good news of the gospel. You can look back to that day when you realized that Jesus had paid for your sins on the cross, that now nothing could separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, that you could have hope for eternity with God because of Jesus, you can at least look back to that day and remember God's goodness. His goodness is why we sing together on Sundays. It's the reason we sing loud together as a congregation so that we can remind one another of his goodness and hear of it from other people's lips. Maybe even when we're in such trouble, we can't sing. What about other times? Can you think of other experiences besides your salvation of God's past goodness in your life? Maybe one of those words on those colorful pieces of paper describes where you're at right now. You're addicted. You're lonely. You're ashamed. You're sick. Can you remember when God saved you before? A specific time when he brought you out of some trouble that you were in for a long time. Remember, saints, Remember what he's done for you. I can remember back to when I was first saved and how he brought me out of a broken family situation and the joy that was on my heart. And I sometimes look to that when I'm in trouble now. 
Maybe you're not a Christian, though. Maybe you're doubting today. Maybe you're not even sure you believe in God. And if that's where you are today, then Jesus is calling you to have faith. Have faith that there is a God who is good. Cry out to him out of your trouble. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You might say to me, Adam, you have no idea what I've gone through. You don't know what I've seen. How can I believe that God is good? Come out of that today. The pain that you've experienced has maybe understandably closed you off to emotional, spiritual vulnerability, including to God. But risk vulnerability to the living God. And the only wounds that you will receive from him are wounds that will make you whole. You've risked vulnerability to people, and they've hurt you and let you down. But if you'll risk vulnerability, opening yourself up to this God, he'll make you whole. Open your heart again to that possibility. Wait patiently for the Lord. Cry out to him about your trouble. He will turn to you and hear. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is rest and blessing for us if we go to the Lord with our troubles. David testifies to this in verses 4 and 5 in this psalm. I hope you have it open in front of you. In these verses, David reminds us that God's past goodness is unrivaled. It's incomparable. He says in verse 4, How happy or how blessed is anyone who has put his trust in the Lord and has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. See, there are plenty of arrogant, there's rivers of arrogant and misguided people who are ready and waiting to help you out of your trouble. There are many of them offering solutions. Some of them are pastors. Others are business leaders or self-help gurus or professors who are proud and run after lies to try to help you. The point here, though, is that blessedness in our troubles comes from trusting Yahweh and no one else can compare. So while other people can offer wise counsel and it's wise to get wise counsel, don't put your trust in people. They will let you down. But put your trust in the Lord Yahweh who will never disappoint even if sometimes it may feel like he delays. Like those stained glass windows made of strips of paper with the troubles written on them, Yahweh is the one who will redeem every trouble. As Tolkien puts it, he'll make every sad thing come untrue. Somehow he weaves even evil to turn out for his good. His goodness is unrivaled. In fact, he alone is good. And look at verse 5. Yahweh, my God, you have done many things. Your wondrous works and your plans for us, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. God's past wondrous works can't be counted. How many good works of God could you count in the Bible? Where would you even start? Maybe, I guess you'd have to start in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created that's a wondrous good work. What's that even mean? What, what all is in that? And then continue on through the chapter. You've got the days of creation, different things, different realms popping into existence at the very word of God, his wondrous works. And drill down into each one of those days, and you've got different plants and different animals and uh, different creatures and beings, and then the cells of those things that he is creating out of nothing with his word you can't get out of Genesis 1 before losing track of the wondrous works of God. Maybe you know the hymn, The Love of God, and the verse that goes, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. His works are like that. They can't be counted. They can't be written and recorded. The Gospel of John, John writes at the end of the Gospel, if I were to try to write all the things Jesus did, there's not enough paper in the world. Now think back over your own life. What has God done for you? Where would, where would you start? How far could you get in your life before you lost count? Maybe you're in trouble now, but he's given you life and breath. 
He's given you food and he's kept you clothed. He's brought you out of hard times. You've seen beautiful sunsets, maybe even some sunrises. He's given you work to do. You probably have air conditioning, maybe even in your car. You have indoor plumbing. You have hobbies. He's given you people who love you and people you love. Was all this goodness given to us by an impersonal, material universe? God's goodness is unrivaled. So how can we get out of trouble? The first step in this psalm is to remember God's past goodness. God's past goodness to David, to us, his church, and to you personally. Remember, this is why you can trust the Lord in your trouble. But after this first part of Psalm 40, David has been, he's been thanking the Lord for the past, and now he's going to turn to the Lord for present help in current trouble. And so we've seen why we can trust the Lord, and next we'll see how to trust God in our trouble, what it looks like to trust him in our trouble. David exemplifies four actions of trust in God in trouble in the rest of this psalm. The first is to take great joy in God. Take great joy in God. To trust God in your trouble will require you to take great joy, joy in God. That's part of what it looks like to trust in God. Let me ask you a question that I don't want you to answer out loud and don't nudge anybody around you. Okay? Who is somebody you have just never enjoyed being around? We can be real in church, right? So just in, in your mind, who's somebody you've never enjoyed being around? Now, do you trust them? No. You can't trust somebody you've never enjoyed being around. Now, who's somebody that you do enjoy being around? At some level, I saw some nudging. That was okay. It's allowed on that one. Uh, at some level, you can trust them. You enjoy being around them. There's some things about them you can trust, right? Well, in verses 6 through 8, David is getting ready to entrust his trouble to God. And we can see in those verses how much he enjoys the Lord. Look with me at those verses, 6 through 8. You did not delight, David is praying to God, you did not delight in sacrifice and offering. You opened my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. Then I said, see, I have come. In the scroll it is written about me, I delight to do your will, my God, and your instruction is deep within me. What's going on in those verses? Well, in the book of 1 Samuel, Samuel kind of summarizes this same idea this way. He's asking a question. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. So David's delight is not in religious activity. David's delight is not in getting what he wants from God by obeying God. You know, one way you can tell if you have an idol, if you have something more important to you than God is... If you obey God to get it and he doesn't give it to you and you're in despair about that, then that thing was more important to you than God. David's delight is not in doing things for God. David's joy is in God and in doing God's will. He delights in it and those are overlapping circles. Trusting God looks like taking great joy in God and in doing his will. So do you delight in doing God's will? Not do you do God's will? Are you careful to do God's will? But deeper, do you delight in doing God's will? Do you take great joy in God? David did. And then second, David proclaimed God's goodness to others. So tell of your joy in God. That's the second way David exemplifies the action of trusting God. We take joy in him and then we tell of our joy in God. This is in verses 9 and 10. He says, I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. See, I do not keep my mouth closed. As you know, Lord, he's reminding the Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I spoke about your faithfulness and salvation. I did not conceal your constant love and truth from the great assembly. Trust in God looks like taking great joy in God and then telling of your joy in God. Do you know that you'll have a perfect opportunity in just a few minutes to tell somebody about your joy in God? 
because this service will be over eventually, the sermon and the service will be over. Uh, that's a joke. I don't, anyway. Uh, it'll be over, and you'll have an opportunity to tell of your joy in God to somebody in the lobby. You can say, hey, can I, can I tell you what Jesus did for me this week? I mean, what more natural place to have that conversation than here after church on a Sunday? You'll have an opportunity in just a few minutes to do that. But, of course, you can bring up God's goodness anywhere. It could be at the checkout line or in a restaurant in, your, in a neighborhood. Um, probably best if it's your neighborhood, but maybe you can go to somebody else's. Uh, on Slack, which is our, our church-wide chat app, if you're, if you're in there, there's a the channel that I'd encourage you to join. It's, it's the Love Your Neighbor channel. And in that channel, you can see how people at Redeemer are working to tell of their joy in God to their neighbors. Uh, just Friday night, there was a family having a block party. The miners were having a block party on their street to invite neighbors over for an opportunity then or in the future to tell them about God. And I heard it went great, that they had a great time and that there'll be more times together. And they're able through that to begin telling their neighbors of God's goodness. Do you trust the Lord like that? Do you speak up about his constant love and truth? Trusting God looks in part like telling others about his goodness. But I want you to notice a repeated phrase in verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11, do you see it? I think it's in any translation. In the Christian Standard Bible, there's, that phrase is repeated, constant love and truth. In the English Standard Version, it's steadfast love and faithfulness. That's an important phrase. It's repeated. Trusting God looks not only like telling others about God's steadfast love and faithfulness. It also looks, third, like trusting God's love for you. For you individually. Not for his people, for the church, but for you. It's finally here in verse 11 that David begins to ask God for what he wants. He prays, Lord, you do not withhold your compassion from me. Your constant love and truth will always guard me. For troubles without number have surrounded me. And now hear these next words. My iniquities have overtaken me. My sins have overtaken me. David's own sin is part of why he's in trouble. And it's such trouble that he goes on to say, I'm unable to see. My troubles are more than the hairs of my head, and my courage leaves me. Lord, be pleased to rescue me. Hurry to help me, Lord. Now, Christian parents, especially parents of teenagers and older, where I think this gets harder, can your children come to you for help when it's their own idiocy and foolishness and sin that got them into trouble? Do they know they can come to you? That's the kind of father David knows Yahweh to be. His own iniquities have caught up to him. What about you? Are your sins catching up to you? Trust God's love for you and turn to him for help. Is your addiction finally overtaking you? Is your fear of people controlling you? Is money dictating your life whether you have too much or never enough? Or food or your body image? Are these things driving you? Are you in rebellion against your parents and you're finally seeing it's not working? In fact, it may even be ruining your life. Is there a sin that's causing you the trouble you're having today? Not all troubles caused by sin. A lot is. If that's where you are, will you trust in God's constant, steadfast love and truth to always guard you, even when God should be mad at you? See, this love here, this love of Yahweh isn't just love with a strong adjective in front of it, not just steadfast, constant. In fact, it's a special single word that refers to the covenant faithfulness of God, the steadfast love of God in his covenant with his people. God has covenanted with his people, made a promise to his people to bless them, and he's made that promise without condition. This steadfast love is his covenant faithfulness. Now, here's what that means for you. It means if you're in Christ by faith and therefore a part of the people of God, the covenant people of God, then for God to stop loving you, he would have to go back on his word. 
he doesn't go back on his word. For God to stop loving you, the entire Bible would have to be false. The entire cosmos would be undone. If you're in Christ, then God can no more stop loving you than gravity can turn off. Are you still stuck to the earth? I can see that you are. It's not like Mary Poppins in here. You're floating around. Are the planets still in motion? Can you see the sun or the moon? Not now, but like when you're outside. Can you see these things? Is the earth still spinning? Then, if you are in Christ, no matter what you've done, God's steadfast love still rests on you. Do you trust his love? Even when it's your own sin that got you in the trouble you're in? You can trust it. Will you? David does. He asks the Lord to hurry to help him, and then he entrusts his troubles to God. And that's the fourth way David shows us how to trust God with our present trouble. Entrust your troubles to God. In the last four verses of Psalm 40, David asks God to let the people who are trying to kill him be disgraced and thwarted and shamed. And then he asks, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation continually say the Lord is great. I am oppressed and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my helper and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. David entrusts his troubles to God, trusting that God will do what's just. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, the Lord says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. David trusts that promise of God. So how do we get out of trouble? We leave our troubles with God in prayer, and then we wait. We wait for him to make things right. That sounds kind of weak, doesn't it? That sounds a little passive. Maybe even you might say unmanly. Just pray and wait. What it actually is, is faith. Trust. It isn't passive unless you don't believe that Yahweh exists. In faithful prayer, we entrust our troubles to God. Are you trying to numb or escape your troubles with addiction or pornography or whatever it may be? Are you trying to numb them with entertainment or other addictions? Run. Quit today. Instead, pray. Gather people around you who will pray with you, even if it's just over text. Take your specific trouble, as best as you can name it, to God in prayer. And leave it there with him. And then come back again tomorrow and do the same thing again. Just like you entrust your money to the bank. Just like you entrust your life to the pilot every time you get on an airplane. Entrust your trouble to God like that through prayer. And we've talked about why you can trust God and how to trust God with your trouble. I want to close with this question. What about when your troubles eclipse your trust? In other words, what about when God's past goodness is hard to get to spiritually and emotionally? It's hard to remember his past goodness. Or what about when you try to do all that David did here and your troubles still overwhelm you? What then? When your troubles eclipse your trust, you know what I'm going to say. In that case, look to Jesus. Be assured that Christ himself has already gone ahead of you carrying your troubles with you and for you. He's already accomplished this psalm for you. As the book of Hebrews says, in Christ we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. He knows your trouble. He knows the trouble you've seen. He knows the pain you've been through. He knows your temptations firsthand. In fact, the New Testament book of Hebrews quotes this psalm. Hebrews 10 quotes Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. I put the relevant passage up on the screen. Take a look there with me. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 5. Therefore, as he, that's Jesus, was coming into the world, his incarnation, he said, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. 
And skip ahead to verse 10. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Christ has already perfectly obeyed Psalm 40 for us in our place. Which means, which means, your troubles have already been prayed for. They've been named perfectly and given to God, entrusted to God, by one who is perfectly delighted to do the will of God, by one who certainly is loved by God with steadfast love. If you've turned from trusting yourself to trusting in Christ, he has already asked God not to delay in delivering you. He died the death you deserved for your sin and rose three days later victorious. And I love the way Pastor Dane Ortland summarizes all this in his reflection on this psalm. He says, looking back at this supreme act of deliverance, the cross, and forward to Christ's second return and our final deliverance, we look to God in confidence despite our present adversities. Looking back at the cross, looking forward to the future, we can look to God in confidence despite our current troubles. And if you don't feel like you can look to God in confidence right now, Jesus is looking to him on your behalf for you praying for you. So take heart, brother or sister in Christ. And take Christ if you're outside of Christ today. Don't wait a minute more. Believe in him. Trust him who's praying for you for your deliverance from your trouble. And what then? Two practical things to do from this psalm. Number one, tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord to you. Tell them today, like we already talked about. Tell somebody what God has done for you today. And number two, if you're not already doing this, consider starting to keep a record of the Lord's goodness to you and looking at that record regularly. Have a providence journal that you look at as part of your regular devotions. What God has done for me. The Puritan John Fl uh, Flavel wrote in a little book on God's providence this same suggestion. And he gave a little warning. He said, take heed of clasping up those rich treasures of God's goodness to you in a book and thinking it enough to have noted them there, right? And the book just sits there. He says, instead, but have frequent recourse to them. Keep looking at them as often as new needs, fears, or difficulties arise and assault you. Now it is seasonable to consider and reflect, was I never so distressed before? Is this the first plunge that ever befell me? Make it as much your business to preserve the sense and value of the memory of former providences and the fruit will be sweet to you. Consider starting a prayer journal, a providence journal, and looking over it regularly. Look over it especially the next time you face trouble. Now let's go to Yahweh together in prayer.